And, uh, but I don't actually work in a Red Hat building. I work uh, from the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, which is well known by the SCAD deadline. It was born there. And I'm from Real Time Linux community. And, uh, but we will see later that working on modeling the properties of 3M30 gave me a, a second topic to continue the research. And uh, it's getting on speed and which is about uh, formal modeling and verification, or runtime verification of the Linux kernel. <coughs> and, uh, well, Linux is complex, right? It's very hard to understand and to explain all the interconnections that we have between subsystems on Linux. And it's hard to describe it. It's hard to understand and even harder to describe it. And Linux is becoming critical. There are many talks from people from BMW, for example, saying that they wanted to use Linux on self-driven cars and on cyber physical systems. And so our bugs will become problems in the real life of um, humans while they are walking on the streets, for example. Uh, and the more and more and more, we need to be sure that Linux behaves as expected. But what do we expect from Linux? Well. We have a lot of documentation saying what we want in many different languages. I've learned Linux in Portuguese from Brazil. That's where I'm from. And uh, we have a lot of asserts and subsystems on Linux that try to, to ensure that the Linux is behaving as we expect as developers. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of things that uh, do some uh, nice work. But we need more. We need more robust ways to show that some properties of the system are correct. For example, how do I prove to uh, the real-time community, the academics one, that the preemption model of the preemptrt is deterministic? How do I expose this? It's hard for them to read in the code, right? Or how, how do we check that the reasoning that we are using to explain how Linux works is correct? How do we check if our assertions are not contradictory. Uh, how do we check that we are covering all the cases? Yeah. And how do we verify that the runtime, the runtime behavior of Linux is, or is the same thing that we are trying to explain? How do we verify that runtime behavior of Linux is the same thing that we meant it to be? And uh, the question is also, how do we convince other community about the properties that we have on Linux? How do we convince the real-time community that the preemptor T is deterministic? Or how will we convince in the future, maybe the long, long future, but how do we convince the uh, certification authorities about the properties that we have on Linux? So we need to, to tell things in a way that these other communities understand as well. And uh, what people in computer science, science usually say when we need such kind of, uh, of a more robust testing, they will point us for formal methods, right? And formal methods are, it's, it's not something that they invite us to, to go there and start trying like BPF, like that people really want to use. Mostly people that see formal methods, it's, it's something that we, we saw in the, during the DCS, and uh, we applied on small projects. We see that it works nicely in small projects, but when we look to a beast like Linux, it's, ooh, it's, it's, uh, it, but well, uh, with time we are seeing good examples of formalism applied to Linux, and we are seeing that these things are good. For example, we have the memory model, that uh, help us to catch problems. I work in the, we will see part of it in the PremTRT model as well. And we have uh, some kinds of runtime ver of uh, uh, code verification as well. Like Kathleen Marinas from Marmi is doing for locking and finding bugs using formal methods. Bugs that we could uh, not easily find just reading the code, right? Uh, okay, we have these examples, but we also need a way that can be more generic and intuitive for the way that we as developers see the system. 
or observe the system. So how can we turn modeling easier? Okay, one way to turn a formal model easier is using a formalism that looks natural for us, like a natural language for us. And uh, the question is, how do we, talking about runtime here, right? How do we naturally observe the dynamic of Linux nowadays? We trace, right? For runtime behavior of Linux, we are always tracing and trying to find uh, some logic behind the trace. We are tracing the scheduled wake up of a task and inside our minds we know that, okay, the task is in a state in which it's ready to execute. But okay, it's not still running. We need the scheduled context switch event to tell me that, okay, now I know that the task is running. So it's on our mind as uh, operating system developers, this idea of uh, events that bring us to states. And uh, this seems a somehow natural way to explain things for us. And uh, if you think on state machines and formal methods, we can see automata as, an, uh, as a possibility. So for these kind of things, or these kind of systems that run on discrete time and uh, generate events that bring to states, we have a theory of uh, discrete event systems. And the evolution of the system is actually described with events, like we try to interpret Linux. And we can, can see like prompt enable, we can, uh, we can say, okay, in the, in the prompt RT we have the system with preemption always enabled, unless we disable the preemption or we enable it back again. So it, it, it's, more, it's a intuitive format. It's not that hard to understand. So for example, uh, you try to think uh, more in the, as an automata. Let's say that we have a network client. Uh, it's a very simple example, right? Just, just to illustrate. So we can say that we can open and close a connection, and we can re write a request and read the reply as many times as we want, and then we can close it back again, and we can start a new connection and read. Okay. It's a good thing that this seems simple. This format looks simple. But on behind the scenes, everything is deterministically the defined. One automata is a set of states, a finite set of events, a set of a, fu a function that gives me, okay, given a state and an event, my next state is this. I have a defined initial state and a defined final state. So this formalism in the, in the automata opens us the possibility of uh, verifying using other methods for verification of the system. For example, we can use temporal logic for, for verifying one automata. We can easily check if my model is deadlock free or live lock free. And uh, it also allows the operations. I can sum, I can join two automatas to build a bigger automata. So taking this very simple example, I can see, I can interpret the system as the joint of the two generators of events. The gen and here I'm explaining a methodolo methodology, right? But so I can see this system break it down into two independent subsystems, one that opens and closes the socket and another that write and read in the socket. And if I think all those, all, uh, all these, think these two small, automatas, I can have a big one with all possible combinations of trace that I can see there, right? And so I can expand my system to have all the possibilities, including those possibilities that we don't want to have. For example, I cannot read and write before opening. We don't accept this. So this is not, uh, this is one, this is a set of uh, events that we don't accept on the system. And we, we also would not like to close and reopen during a operation. So it doesn't seem to look good for my system too. So I need to avoid these operations in the system. How do we do that? We create another set of automatas that specifies the correct behavior of the system or what we expect from the system. So for example, I can say that I will only close the socket if I am not already in a read and write operation, 
waiting for something. And I can say that I will only write a read after opening the socket, right? Then if I synchronize all these automata, in this case, I've got an error. I did the verification say that the system is blocking. That is, my automata here, there, there is a problem on those automata, right? And then if I look at the synchronization of all the system, I will see that, okay, I forgot something here because I don't want to have this connection after closing. So I don't want to read and write after close. And, that's, and there's something in this part that's avoiding me to return to the safe state, which is this state with two circles. Thinking again, okay, it was this part of the model. Now I can open, I can do read or write only after opening and, uh, and before closing. But before this, I don't allow this operation. And this is the same thing. So I can write and read, but I cannot close here in the middle. And now joining everything, I will have back my simple, my simple automat. Okay, but why why don't I just draw it from from the beginning? Why such a complex complexity to have such a small model? I just draw it, right? Yeah, and for small models, that's correct. But Linux is complex. Linux is not that simple. And uh, I did one automata model to show the properties of the preempt RT the, in the synchronization level of preemption, RQs, and lockings. And uh, my final automata for a single CPU has uh, 90,000 in states and 23,000 transitions. So I could not draw it with my own hands, not in the lifetime of my PhD. <laughs> So, but breaking it down in small pieces and assembling them back, I could, I could uh, break down this complexity into 12 generators and 12 generator in 12 independent pieces and 33 specifications saying what we want and what we don't want between two subsystems. And uh, my original idea was to use the parameter T to explain the model for the parameter T to explain properties of the parameter T parameter model. But during the course of the research, we end up finding three bugs that would not be detected by any other tools. Just by trying to refine the model and comparing the model with the Linux execution. And it turns out that this, this seems to be more, even more promising or having a bigger impact than the fact that I model one, one case for Linux. And that's what is, uh, is motivating me or motivating my research to try to continue looking more for the verification side. Because I'm a real-time guy. I like that area. But just to return there, so my idea was to explain the parameter T. And then I, you guys don't need to understand it right now. I, I will put a reference for the papers. I'm just showing how hard it can be modeling part of Linux behavior. So I could see independent, uh, independent systems like the set need rescad. We can wake up a task that it will be runnable, and then it can be sleepable again if we set that sleep, sleepable. Uh, I can start the scheduling and returning from the scheduler. I can disable preemption to avoid the scheduler, and I can disable preemption to, to actually schedule. You see. These are all very obvious subsystems. I can disable IRQs to avoid IRQs, and I can have IRQs disabled by the hardware, for example, to handle a IRQ. It's not an action from the current thread, but from the hardware. I can have a task switching in and out, and um, this is the same idea, but uh, in a different context. And now, with those small pieces of very obvious things, I start to, to put restrictions on them. So for example, I will, I will never have the scheduling entering and exiting with IRQs disabled. And, uh, but I will always disable and enable preemption before calling the scheduler, a special way to disable the preemption. 
I will always have a uh, contact switch inside the scheduler. Th th that's obvious, right? But we can have some, some more necessary conditions. Okay, and I'm explaining here as a kernel developer. But we can translate this into, into properties that we usually write on papers, like these are the necessary conditions for that other condition to take place, or these are the sufficient conditions for this to take place. So we can translate this back into the way that we usually write on papers. And uh, so I will disable the, I will not allow this, the, this sketch switch if I'm not with local RQs and or if I'm not with RQs disabled and preemption disabled to schedule the system and so on. So, up, up, okay. And okay, and this is the most complex automata that I have in the modeling. So all that complexity, the most complex one is this. Okay, it's not that simple, but still, it's, it's doable. It's, it's, uh, we can understand it with some effort. And this is the path that once I have the set need reset that says that I have a new higher priority thread on, on a CPU, what are the set of conditions or the paths that I can take until the SCAD switch in of the task? It can happen, if this happens during the scheduling, it will only happen. It will only return. But these are the set of uh, deterministic events that can happen between, say, I need to reschedule and I'm starting running the highest priority thread. And this shows in a formal way that the preemption model of the RT in this synchronization level is deterministic. And that's a good property to show for the real-time academy and maybe for certification authorities. Okay, I said that it will be hard to explain this all here online. It's just an example of things that we can do. But I'm not trying only to convince myself or Linux developers. I also need to talk with academy if they think if it's correct or not, if this is acceptable or not by their community. And uh, these are the papers in which I explain. I first explained the, the, the IRQs, the, the interrupts in a paper. Then I did an ongoing project for the threads and then the threads. And so it was academically accepted, the idea of using automata to explain Linux and the results of the explanation. So, okay. Till there I was explaining how to uh, formally describe the behavior of Linux. But how can we use it? From a model, we can use many techniques from formal methods. There are those that goes more to the code level thing that try to explore all the, the paths and uh, temporal logic and all those stuff. And they would require some kind of modeling. But I, and I believe this is good and, uh, and we need to explore that too. But for now, I'm trying to work with the runtime behavior of the system. So how do you check if the runtime behavior of Linux is what we expect or how to check if, how to verify that Linux behaves? We have the model, that's how Linux should behave. And here we have the system and we compare, and we compare both, right? So that was the methodology that I used to create the model of Linux. We have the informal knowledge of how the prem chart works and we have the kernel itself. Here I start modeling using those small pieces and then I trace the system. Here I was using perf and tracing the same events that I was using to model. Right, And then I get the perf.data and the automata in the graph of its format. It's a well-known format. It's open format. And then try to validate if the automata and the kernel were matching. If, obviously, at the beginning of the process, the vast majority of the problems will be in the model, right? Because we need, we need to, to capture all the behaviors, and it's very hard. But after some time, what happened is that the problems were not in the model anymore. There were problems in the kernel. And then we start seeing, seeing the benefits of this for the runtime verification of Linux. And this happening in reality. The problem is that as I was using perf, 
I would have to collect a lot of data. For example, in a single core system, 30 seconds of tracing was generating 2.5 gigabits of data. And I was having to transfer this all to user space to do the processing. So it was good to, in the modeling and that part of the project, but it was not enough for us to turn this practical for our daily basis uh, verification of the system. And um, thinking on the formal methods uh, or formal verification uh, words, I was using an offline and asynchronous uh, verification model. So that is, I was tracing the system and then analyzing it after, not during the execution. So what can we do? Well, we can use an online and synchronous runtime verification. That I will explain. These are the steps, and I'll explain step by step now. So the first input that we have is that massive model. It's a huge model. And it will take me a lot of time to transform that dot .file into C structures, right? Because there's 9,000 states. So what I did, I created a Python script that translates the model into C code. So I don't need to translate this by hand. So just giving one example of a small, small automata that says, OK, I will only wake up a task while non-preemptive. So preemptive disable, enable. Preemptive disable, I can have it. Preemptive, with preemptive enable, I cannot have it. So dot to C in the, dot, the, the tool, dot to C, in the model, and I generate first this set of uh, states as an enum and a set of events as an enum. And I use these values to say the size of these structures that I have. And I use very simple structures that I can fulfill in the code translation itself. So in the end, I have a uh, a vector to give me the names of the events, like uh, events, preemptive disable is, is in the zero, the preemptive enable is in the first, and same thing for states, very simple data structure. And here I have the, the function that says, okay, if I am in, with preemptive disable, if I am in preemptive, right, and if I receive the preemptive disable, so zero, 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 I will go to the non preemptive. And here is the initial state, and uh, I see the song. And, uh, and here are my, is, me, is my initial state, and my final state is this. So, but let's see in the code how do I use it. So processing, when I receive one event to process, I have a helper function that gives me the current state. I'm receiving the event here, right? I get the current state. Given the current state and the event that I'm receiving, I set the next state. If it's a more, it's a valid state, I can print some debug things here and uh, return true and move my, my system to the next state while comparing the execution. And, uh, or I can generate an error and uh, like print this stack trace. Now, doing a, a zoom on the functions, like to get the name of the state is just a lookup in a vector. Getting the name of the event, I look up in the vector. Getting the next state, I look up in a matrix. So, and saving the state is just one variable. And so all this simplicity gives me the property that all my operations are O of one. And this is good for scalability. So each kernel event that I hook will need only O of one operations to, for me to try to run and compare the Linux execution against the model. And so finally, what I do is that I, I compile that, the, the, the self-generated mo uh, model with some other functions that hooks me to the trace points. And there's a good thing about hooking to the trace points is that I can do the verification without changing the kernel and without modifying the kernel as it is and without requesting uh, functions of the verification code to be added to the Linux kernel code. And so I avoid the asking Thomas to add more code to the PremTRT. And that's good. I make them happy. And also, I did this because I know that Peter would not allow me to put code there as well. So hooking to trace points gives me the freedom to work freely on my own work. <laughs> 
And then it's also a good thing because we actually don't need to have two versions of our code, one for debugging and one for runtime. We are actually observing the system as it will run. So there will be no case of problems that we catch with debug, with, uh, debug disabled, but we don't catch with debug enabled because this structure changed because I need to change these structures to add the code there. So in the normal case, we, I run the system. I can, uh, okay, I receive a function. I try to run the, the model. If it's okay, I can run silently or I can print some error. And uh, in the case of, uh, oh, I can run silently or, or print the bug information. But if I find one, uh, during the execution, one event that was not expected, I print information to the trace. So for example, this simple automaton, I cannot have scheduled waking while in preemptive, and I was tracing the system, and I saw that, okay, I was in non-preemptive, received preempt enable, bring me back to preemptive, and so I'm here, it's safe, and then I received the scheduled waking event, and this wasn't expected on my model. So there is something wrong here. It's not expected to have a scheduled waking while in this state. And so I printed the, the stack to figure out where the problem was. And it turns out that it was a problem in the, in the trace points of enabling assembly preemption. And we actually reported this upstream, the problem, and these are our discussion. I, I put the self-generated mod of the model with the, the kernel module with the model inside to reproduce the problem here. So anyone could try to use this, this as a test case for the system. And these were the conditions that things happen and show it, it occurring. And then here is the explanation that we, I, could, I could develop after and try to understand the problem. And here is the code. So it turns out that these things can, can add a real benefit on our daily work. But there is no free meal, right? I am editing more code to execute and I am using uh, a not so compact data structure to express my model, right? I could think, okay, I can use a link at least so I cannot have that big table of events. But it turned out that if I would add a more complex data structure, the auxiliar, auxiliar data that I would require for this structure would, be, would, be, would require more data than the data I would like to find itself. And even for my, that big model, in the end, the, the, the kernel module has just only k, of, uh, only k bytes of data. So it's something acceptable, no? For a test case on a, that big model. And the, the benefit is that by using the, those simple data structures, I have O of 1 operations. So for example, this is another model that we can use in practice. That is on the prem 30 one problem that we usually try to find is when we call a function or a method that might go to sleep on the atomic context, when we have either preemption or RQ disabled or both disabled. So if we call some of these functions, we, these functions that can go to sleep, in this context we will have a scheduling while in atomic error. That is a common error that we try to find. Nowadays we have ways <laughs> to detect this, but we need to either enable lockdap or to wait for the, the thread actually going to sleep, right? And uh, if I hook this event to the kernel functions that might end up eventually going to sleep and uh, try to monitor this in runtime, I can catch these problems with the regular kernel without recompiling with lockdap and uh, not necessarily needing to touch the scheduler on before, even if it's in the current execution, it doesn't go to sleep. Okay, this is a practical use case, but how efficient is this idea? Because if this added too much overhead to the system, it, it will be okay, but maybe for testing things from PMTRT, we will need first either to run performance test first and then logical test later. But to try to show if my idea was efficient enough, I run some benchmarks while running the, this, this simple automata, recalling that it doesn't matter if the automata is big or not. 
What matters is the events that I'm tracing. If I'm using a very large automata or a very small automata that has the same uh, set of events, the overhead will be the same because I am O of 1 per event, not per states. The number of states doesn't matter for the efficiency. So how efficient is this? I did some throughput tests. We use the Pharonix test suite. And as I am from real-time community, I did some cyclic test experiments to see how it, influence, it uh, affects the latency. That is our main metric. I tested the system as is, without any trace or verification, nothing, just as we would run in production. And I run the system with that model I show, and just tracing with F-trace the same events. I'm not trying to interpret events, not, not either collecting the events, just tracing and putting the data to the trace buffer. So this is the, the use case. It, it might be good if we could run it uh, while testing the parameter T. And so with low throughput on the kernel, OK, no, well, throughput test, but low kernel activation, I'm running mostly on user space, we can see that both the, the verification and the kernel added some overhead, but it's, it's, it's OK for production. We can run it. It will, won't kill the system. Sometimes it's the, the measurements give, it, give us uh, results that, in the error, that are in the error margin, like the verification run faster than the system as is. But that's not true. It's just because we are, we're not affecting the system that much. And we run very efficiently in, in this case. But when we try to go in further and try to to verify that the, the system with that automata uh, with a high kernel activation, like socket activity, contact switching, and message passes, we see, we obviously see perform degradation when verifying. That's expected. We're running more code. But as the data structure that I'm, I'm dealing are simple in our O of 1, and I don't need to save data to trace buffers when running silently, the performance it can be better than tracing because obviously tracing needs to do with memory. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying that we need to save more data. And as with my method, I'm saving very low amount of data. It has this property of running well. But the best thing that this result shows me is that as I can run trace on production, I can do verification on production as well. And, uh, and that's a good thing. So, and another way to look for these automatas is looking at them as a way to do parsers, online parsers of the trace that we do. We say in the automata format what is the, the expected thing that we want in the trace, and let the automata analyze to myself. I don't need to go line by line trying to identify it. So it can be seen as an a interpreter for the tracing as well. And uh, doing the benchmark with cyclic test, here is the, the results. Here I was using another model that touches all the events I used in the, the Prem30 model. So I, I can compare the results. So here is the system tracing. It adds a little bit of overhead. It's obviously is an acceptable overhead. It's something very, cl very, very close. You see, it, it, it's very good, but still, as we're saving less data while verifying, we do a little bit better. It, it means that it, it's safe for us. I don't want to say that F trace is not good. I love F trace. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm saying that the verifying can be as good as tracing, right? The impact is, is an impact that we already know and is acceptable for production systems. And that's good. And. Uh, it's important when doing search, when we are touching the kind of uh, knowledge that it's not usually the knowledge that we have in the, obviously we have people with this knowledge in the real time on the Linux community. But as we are touching things that are way more, that are very well accepted in the academy, academic world, that, that's their realm. It's not our realm. As I was touching, the, the words and the, the I'm missing the word in English. As I'm using the, no, it wasn't that word. <laughs> I'm, as I'm talking on their context, okay, context. 
And uh, it, it's good for me to have the feedback from them that I'm not saying anything that's obviously wrong. And that actually I'm trying to, to be productive for that community as well. And uh, last week I presented this work in the Software Engineer Formal Methods Conference in, in Oslo. And it was very well received by the academic uh, community. And that's good because the more things, the more we can bring Linux close to the community and the community close to Linux, the more benefits we can bring. It's a win-win thing. And uh, people wanted, professors wanted to talk to me to, to get uh, access to the code and uh, how I develop things. It's everything open. I will talk with a professor in Zurich because they work with a formal verification and runtime verification. And they have interest of, of working on this as well. And, uh, and this is good. The more, thing, the more we can bring people from the academia to Linux, the, more, the better will be our results in the future. So, it's possible to model, to model complex behavior of Linux, but here, again, I'm talking about runtime behavior. There, is, there are way more methods to do the verification, like uh, the, in the structure level or in the code level. Here I'm talking about uh, event level, right? But it's possible to model these high-level design models for Linux, complex model, using a formal language. Uh, we can create big models from small ones and do these. And this helps out the, in the development itself and the maintenance of the model, because I don't need to read that huge model. right? And uh, it's possible to verify the properties of a model. So when we, when we go for checking for these properties using uh, temporal logical, for example, uh, it's very hard to apply this for code. Okay, it can, it's possible maybe to apply by code, but generally you need to create a model of how things works and then you use other types of verification. So an automata seems to be a good translation language from the, the code to a formal method that can be explored with all these other possibilities. Uh, and, and so it's possible to use uh, other methods upon the automata, but in, in my case, I'm interested now in the runtime and checking the runtime behavior of Linux, and it's possible to do it, hooking to trace, not uh, not uh, having to, to to talk to Thomas, asking to add more code to print RT, and. Uh, and it can run in production because it doesn't affect that much. It's, a, it's, a, it's affect as much as the things that we already run on production. And uh, what is next? So obviously this is an ongoing project. I have those, I have everything here in this page. Go there, download, criticize, uh, talk to me and uh, and that's what I like to do. I'd like to talk and discuss because I need feedback from the kernel community to, to, to actually make something that is usable for the kernel community. And uh, I have uh, the, the Linux model here, the paper, and the, the efficient verification here as well. But still, I, this is just a proof of concept for a paper. I need to work on a better interface. It's possible either to do a F-trace-like interface or a perf and ABPF approach. Uh, I will try to do both and see which one uh, fits better for my case. Arnaldo Carvalho de Mello got interested on in making this, and I will, I'm talking, I will talk to him to make this because he's way more expert than I am on perf, I think. And, uh, and try to use F-trace because it, uh, I like F-trace. And then compare both. And, uh, but, and there is another, like, um, another thing that comes from the discussions is, like I was talking to Dimitri, where is he? Syscaller. Yeah. And uh, he found that this can be useful with Syscaller to try to find uh, bugs on run time as well. So this kind of feedback that you guys give me and the ways to proceed and ideas, please give me because the more the more motivation I get, the easier it will be to me to justify to my manager that I'm working on it. 
And uh, okay, uh, I need to translate those papers, which are in one language to Linux kernel language, which is the LWN articles. I'm talking to Jake to try to make it, so we can uh, talk in a more informal way. And, uh, and obviously, if, if this thing is useful, it should not be useful just for one case. We need it to have in, uh, on other user cases to make it useful and to make it worth. Oh, it wasn't. No, no, no. He means very like modeling it. Ah, okay, but that's <laughs> yes, yes and no. In Italian, would be ni, neither yes nor no. No, okay, few text yes, but this is okay. I will reach there in the next slide. In uh, this slide. So everything that we can analyze uh, with events, it's suitable for this kind of verification. Still, there are way, way more methods that can be applied, and way different ways that can be applied, and way more language that can fit for better proposal on a more specific case or still. So, like trying to, to get some behavior of Locked App, it would be nice, and uh, maybe a few texts if we get a person brave enough to, to do it. Uh, can I say? Yeah, we, me and Joel, we are trying to model, we will try to model RCU, which is, which will be another nice example of complex things. <laughs> we shall look. And maybe scheduler, well, what is next? Um, and I hope you guys have more ideas of what, what could be next. And, and that's a good thing. That's why I expect and I hope. But yeah, it's worth mentioning that I'm not trying to resolve all the verification things, problems with these methodology, right? It's good for, for events. But for something more code level, uh, static code analyzer, analyzers thing, it's another kind of problem. And uh, okay, you can try to, if, uh, yeah. this is another kind of problem, it's more complex and it has its, its own, own languages. But uh, the, my methodology seems to be work fine for the more design level, not code level. Design level in intersection of subsystems, right? More in the behavior and not in the code level. But still, I, I really hope that we have more things for the static code analysis as well because we can have a lot of benefits from that as well. The more we have, the better. And the more we try to talk with our academy about those things and get them interested, they will have a motivation to do a realistic work and we will have a more code and more methodology. So it's a win-win working with academy. And uh, something else? Uh, no, I think I talk, said everything, everything I wanted to do. And thank you and questions. His question was, let me see if I understand. If I could add the timing to the modeling to yeah. consider a timeout or not. Okay. Yeah, you don't have the events you're supposed to, to get. Okay. The format of automata I use here, it was on purpose the simplest one. Because from the simplest one, we can apply other methodologies easier. So there are timed automatas that model these things with time in uh, in, in the model, and you can model timeouts or model timing behavior, and that's something that we can explore in the future. But or maybe um, a, a timeout maybe can be just another event. Yes, and that and that that's that's the, the my next phrase would be. You don't necessarily need to have the counter of the time there. You can say, okay, uh, this system is waiting. And it can generate as either received or timeout. So you can translate one event into the other, and you have this flexibility. 
But when doing this, we can enrich the, uh, the verification using timed automata. And there is a, whole, a big theory b behind it. And, and that's something that I consider on the, ne on the future work on the papers. OK. Uh, second question. Uh, um, if your, your tradition table uh, maybe grow in memory, uh, it, can, it can be very large because of the number of events uh, per, uh, per state. So is it possible to, to fit in memory? I, I don't have the Yes, uh, that, that's why I try to show, OK, there can be, I'm talking to finite state, so it's, it's bounded the amount of power that we, we use. And um, OK, if we have a system with uh, 9,000 states and 23,000 uh, uh, transitions generated a less than one megabyte of, uh, okay. of data, it seems, OK, this problem is valid, but it seems that we have a margin here to work on it. In, in the sense that, okay, it, it's not uh, compact, but okay. it, it's, it's, it still is okay. Yeah, but sure, in the future it might be, and I hope that there is case that we touch the limits. Thank you. No problem. Hi. Uh, do you think you could generate the runtime automata by looking at but analyzing the code itself without running Linux directly? Okay. That, that's a good question, and it always comes. So. We can, u we can see this on two ways. Okay. The first is trying to create a validation model, like I created here, that says, okay, these are my valid transitions, and they are bounded to a limit, and I try to run the kernel, seeing the, if the language that the kernel is generating is valid or not. Right. Now, think on this case. I will generate the model from the trace. Given Give that you can find a finite set of states from running this, right? Let's say that you use a graph reduction tree algorithm to try to find a bound, because it's not impossible that on Linux you can have a disable IRQ, enable IRQ, disable IRQ, enable IRQ, disable IRQ forever. So when you try to draw a DAG from this, then that's what you could get from the trace. Uh, you have a, a limited number of states. But given that you could use a methodology to, to generate a state uh, a minimal, right? Something bounded. Let's say using graph theory, there should be a way. If you create this, and if your system has a bug, you will include the bug in the model. And that's why self-generating the, the model might not create a valid validation model. You see, but there, there are other applications, right? I'm not trying to say generate the model. I'm just, like, I'm just trying to say generate the runtime module by just not running it. But you would have to still write the model yourself to compare. Ah, self-generating of the kernel module with the... No, uh, of the... Well, we can talk about it. Oh, okay. I'm wondering uh, why you decided to have a full model with 9,000 states and how... Why, why did I... Yeah, how is it... Uh, is it useful? Can you reason when you find something wrong on this model ah. rather than working on the separate one from the scheduler? For okay. That, that's another good thing about trying to make a, a modular model because I don't reason it. I don't do my reasoning here. It's impossible. I do my reasoning on the small pieces. Mm -hmm. So when one event happens and it's not expected, it's not expected in the full model, but also in the small model that is blocking it. And then I go analyze that model. And so that's why the modular approach is good. And that's why one of a self-generating modeling approach would not be good because we cannot extract the small model. We would ju just have this as a result. And this is not, it's useful, but it's not as useful as a modular. The, the, he was asking before. Yeah. Um, regarding the question of uh, not running the kernel to, but just look at the source code to generate a, a runtime table, uh, the problem is uh, you can get a theoretical one, uh, but you might also have dead branches that actually never lead to those uh, events. And once you start having uh, things like uh, callbacks, 
or uh, casting to uh, trust me, uh, I know what I'm doing. Uh, you can also lose the static analysis uh, about what gets called when. Yeah, and 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 that's the, the static code analysis is very powerful, but it's it's harder to reach. You some it's harder to to do, and I hope we some someday be able to do static code analysis on Linux and extract the model, but. There's, there's, there's a long path, and, and I agree with what you were saying. Uh, here. Um, so the model is getting quite big, and would it be possible to, instead of tracing the full model, trace each of the individual generators in your very Yes, product? yes, but recall that the, the complexity is O of 1 per event, right? So if I have three, four models, I will have uh, four executions of O of 1 operation. So it will be O of 1, O of 1 per execution, but O of n in the, name, in the number of uh, states for the verification. So it will be bounded by O of n of the number of the submodels. So it would be not as efficient as I com if I compare the entirely model because I would just have one event to process in the big uh, automata. So it's more efficient. It's better to understand in the modular and the, the analysis you do all in the modular, but when comparing with the system execution, it's better if you do with the big one, because the big one will be always just one operation per event and not the number of uh, uh, small models per event. Questions? Ideas of other things to model? Uh, thank you for the talk. More than uh, other things to model, just like uh, another use case. Um, I think uh, one problem is like, like this is a runtime analysis, so uh, we detect a bug only if we run that bug. But this can also can be used to look at the fast path. So for uh, improving performance of the fast.